The Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure is one of the most insulting pieces of children's media ever conceived. Now you're probably thinking, why the hell am I complaining about something made for literal babies? What are you, Dylan Go Animate Fan 63728 or something? Fool, just look at the poster. That's not for you to watch. Well, well, just trust me on this. It's that bad. One thing I refrain from doing on this channel is discussing preschool shows unless they're exceptionally bad. Like Peppermint Park was a Sesame Street ripoff. Off, that's unintentionally disturbing. That's worth criticizing. If you want to count the JoJo and Bobo show show as a preschool show, that was lazy celebrity endorsement corporate garbage worth criticizing. Sometimes, preschool shows can treat kids like complete idiots by just making hyper-stimulating noise with no challenge at an age where accepting challenge is very important. Two plus two is four. Two plus two is four. <laughs> I can see why this is so popular. Look at him. <laughs> and I'm talking like preschool shows, not all ages media, which includes preschoolers and parents. I also try to refrain from discussing preschool garbage that everybody already knows is bad. Like, Caillou is a terrible show for kids, but he's like the most hated character in fiction, probably. Like, everybody knows it's shit. I also think Peppa Pig and Coco Melon treat kids like idiots, but that's not breaking new ground. When I was in 10th grade, my friend wanted me to review Dora, something I haven't done for these reasons. I've mentioned the Air Buddies series on this channel multiple times, and yeah, there's shit I could make fun of. For example, one of the characters is named Buddha, and he has a running gag of shouting mantras. Like, does that count as making fun of a religion that's not Christianity? Like, could they get away with that now? Well, I guess you gotta be smoking Buddha to be in the right mood to write a talking dog movie, but it's not like that bad. Like, as an adult, if you were to do a video on a preschool show, it's gotta be an exceptional fuck up. In other people's case, like Dylan Go Animate Fan 63728, not so much. Yo, we're counting down the top 10 worst baby shows. Number 10. Frozen, it's gay. Number nine, The Nut Shack. I watched Mr. Enter's video on it. Not a baby show, but on this list anyway. Number eight, Caillou. He is a bald ass bitch that never shuts up. Number seven, Lazy Town. It has a black character. I remember when I was like six, I discovered like Cartoon Network and gradually stopped watching Sprout and Nick Jr. You know, cause like my brain is forming. I want to see Chowder spice up some knishes. But if there's no like Camp Laszlo or whatever airing, I just switch to a preschool channel and make fun of it. Pretending to dub over Special Agent Oso and making poop jokes. Hey, hey Oso, can you, can you, can you help me? Uh, no, I'm gonna poop on you. <laughs> Liam shouted at the television while his parents were probably neglecting him. And all these years later, I guess not much has changed. Then when I was like seven and a half, I discovered YouTube and developed an unhinged obsession with the Annoying Orange, which is a big boy show, by the way, because Apple gets cut with a knife, okay? It's easy to dunk on a preschool show once you graduate preschool, but rarely is it justified. But the Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure is a great example of everything not to include in your preschool movie. Say, look at this. I've been cleaning out my nest, and I found an old book of my poetry. Did you know that this here is a killer and a thief that has invaded the world? Do you know what this criminal is? Yes. White sugar. Why is white sugar a killer and a thief? The origin of the Oogie Loves can be traced back to an obscure kid show called My Bed Bugs, created by Alex Green and Carol Sweeney, which aired for two seasons for a little over a year between March of 2004 and March of 2005 and is partially lost media. Of the 27 episodes, 14 have resurfaced and are found. Six are partially found and eight are lost completely. The show focuses on a trio of bed bugs named Woozy, Toofy, and Gooby, as well as their talking vacuum J. Edgar, their talking pillow Snoozy, their talking fish Ruffy, and their talking window Wendy. The show is a mascot preschool show, which were in their peak in the late 90s to the mid 2000s ish. Like Barney, Yo Gabba Gabba, Teletubbies, Hip Hop Harry, Booba. Hell, Backyardigans was intended to be one before going the CG route. These were fully articulated suits typically, which takes advantage of being able to interact with humans more. Would you do me a favor, would you hold my foot? This 
is gross! Big Bird wasn't the first, like, non-traditional full-body Muppet, but he was easily the first beloved. You know, he could walk around more and express more, unlike Cookie Monster and company, which are restricted to the confines of a frame-defined backdrop. J. Edgar serves as the father figure to the Bug Trio, and the other characters are like family pets. While playing around their house, they discover an interest, serving as the topic of an episode, and we get to see them perform that activity. When watching this show, something completely threw me off in the intro, and it took me a second to process exactly what. The show was aired on PBS Division, networks, but was seemingly syndicated on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, which Joy Junction was also syndicated on. And in old recordings of Joy Junction, you can see snippets of my bedbugs in the promotional segments. Joy Junction is another rabbit hole I've already discussed on this channel, and I was not expecting a tie-in. This means that the Trinity Broadcasting Network might actually be a potential lead in finding more My Bedbugs and Joy Junction episodes. What Remains of My Bedbugs is a fine show for kids, nothing exceptional, but the fact that it was in, like, the same kind of subgenre as Teletubbies is crucial to its history. Teletubbies is a bug juice show for kids that everybody already agrees that it's shit and some find unintentionally disturbing. But kids love bug juice. Bug juice is a really sugary drink you can find in Midwestern ghetto convenience stores, probably across from the Spongebob popsicles. That's what I call hyper-stimulating content garbage for children, you know, because it's like sugar. Teletubbies airing from 1997 to 2001, it was a huge hit. It ended before I was born, but I still saw it after it wrapped up, and I can recall it being popular beyond its ending in 2001. And trust me, I did watch that pure bug juice shit that was Teletubbies. But the head marketer of both Teletubbies and Thomas and Friends at the time, Ken Wieselman, wanted to make a theatrical Teletubbies movie. However, those plans never went anywhere because Teletubbies creator Ann Wood rejected the idea, and I agree with Miss Wood's decision. How the fuck do you turn, let's make Tubby Custard into a movie? Also, theatrical preschool movies have incredibly limited audiences. Seemingly, he wanted this to be theatrical to create a new market of interactive theatrical children's movies. But kids and family is all ages. Preschool is only preschool. And there have been a handful of preschool theatrical movies in the past, like Thomas and the Magic Railroad, which I hated as a small child. Like, I liked other Thomas media, some of the early CG stuff and the original model stuff. But I hated this movie because there was so much of fucking Alec Baldwin in it. Alec Baldwin plays the human character, and there was too much fucking Alec Baldwin and not enough Thomas. Haven't seen it since, but it was a huge flop. Sesame Street has had two theatrical movies, Follow That Bird in 1985 and The Adventures of Elmo in Grouchland in 1999. Bird was a moderate financial loss and Elmo was one of two 1999 Muppet box office bombs. Follow That Bird became a beloved classic later, and it's about as great as a preschool movie could be. It's not better than the best of the all ages, the Muppet Show spin-off movies, but it's fun. Nothing deep like Rainbow Connection or anything, but it's a well-made preschool movie that's not bug juice. Elmo and Grouchland isn't poorly made either. It's not something I'd recommend to go out of your way to watch as an adult, unlike Follow That Bird, but it's not bug juice, and that's what matters most, so I commend it. Dude, look at the Count's lowrider. God damn, that goes fucking hard. So not even the biggest dog of all when it comes to preschool entertainment could make a hit preschool theatrical movie. But in recent years, there's actually been two exceptions, the Paw Patrol theatrical duology. I haven't seen them because I'm the wrong demographic, obviously, but they kept them super low budget at about 30 million each and made their money back each time. If they gave these movies a proper 200 million-ish Pixar DreamWorks budget, it would have been a tremendous loss. Why is there no Kanye dog? Why only Kim dog? Kanye would be a great influence on impressionable children. You could argue Dora and the Lost City of Gold was a successful enough preschool movie, but even if it is based on a preschool property, it's more of a live-action remake, which is a much more viable genre, considering it wasn't tying into any concurrently airing Dora television series. 
The same could apply to the Clifford the Big Red Dog live-action theatrical remake. As of writing, a Harold and the Purple Cran remake just got announced, and what the fuck am I looking at? But about the interactive rejected proposal, how the fuck do you make Tubby Custard interactive? Well, the film was inspired by Wieselman seeing the audience go apeshit during a screening of Medea Goes to Jail. And if there's two things The Hood loves, it's Tyler Perry and drag and noise. But conceptually, his idea was more comparable to Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is an adaptation of a musical that became a cult phenomenon after its original failed theatrical run, succeeding with its second chance in midnight screening. Hollywood's biggest example of just cause you ain't gonna like it, that don't mean The Hood gonna love it. During those midnight screenings, people just started dressing up as the characters and screaming in the theater, and that tomfoolery made money, so it just became the standard of viewing the film. Seeing it re-ran in the theater is like the one day of year you're allowed to scream in a jackass in public without getting looked at, unless you like Star Wars. And I clearly love screaming in edgy emo makeup, so it gets a pass in my book. Rocky Horror is also not a kid's movie. So why the fuck would you combine Rocky Horror and Teletubbies? Rocky Horror wasn't even designed to include tomfoolery, it just happened, it was the 70s, everyone was high off their ass and it just stuck. Come to think of it, when you're a hyper four-year-old, every movie is a science fiction double feature. Even in a Pixar movie, Dr. X will build a creature. So because of this fucking asinine concept, a non-existent market, and the lack of IP rights, the Teletubbies theatrical movie never went anywhere. Like, why make a movie that encourages children to not shut the fuck up? Teletubbies couldn't be acquired, was the main thing stopping this motherfucker. So he decided to make Rocky Horror for four-year-olds with My Bedbugs. My Bedbugs is an obscure, failed, partially lost show, so I guess making My Bedbugs the movie would make no sense, because nobody knows who the fucking bedbugs are. Like Thomas, Sesame Street, and Paw Patrol are big dog, no pun intended, preschool franchises. Those had to earn their risks of going to the big screen. So successfully acquiring the rights to use elements from my bedbugs, the Oogie Loves were created. The designs were tweaked. They no longer only wore pajamas. They were no longer bugs. Zuzi's design stayed mostly the same, but colors were changed besides that. Trying to create a new genre is a red flag of and of itself, like People get inspired by your thing, and it becomes a genre. You can be a godfather of a genre unknowingly. Like, you can't just fucking do that and succeed. But investors still scrapped enough together for the project. The film costs somewhere between 12 to 20 million dollars. Sources are inconsistent. But the marketing budget was 40 million dollars. It had to be heavily marketed to get the world hyped for the Oogie Loves. There was billboards on Hollywood Boulevard. It was advertised outside of the Toys R Us on Times Square, you know, the one with like the big ass Ferris wheel inside, rest in peace. There was big banners of characters in the theater. There was a play place in theater lobbies. They handed out merch for free. The Oogie Loves gave a comically large check to a daycare center in Manhattan. There were tons of moms posting about it on Facebook. I can hardly wait! Only in theaters, Oogie's 29th. Oogie's 29th made film history. Because over the film's entire run, it grossed a little over a million dollars. That's what the kids call epic fail. So at max, that's like a hundred twenty million dollars down the drain. Now, there's been movies with like larger losses, like for example, last year's The Flash made two hundred seventy-one million on a two twenty million budget. So that's like half a billion down the drain. But at least The Flash made millions, not a million. So this film only made about 0.83% of its budget back. You need to make at least double your budget to be considered viable. Like Conan even made fun of it after its box office failure and he like actually got one of the suits from the movie on the show. Well last weekend a box office record was broken, but I'm not talking about a good one, all right? The children's movie, the Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure. I'm gonna say that title again. The Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure had the worst opening weekend in all of cinema history. Well, anyway, I wanted to find out more about the, cause mm -hmm. that just fascinates me. And yeah. this thing, nobody went to right. see it. So I have invited one of its stars on the show. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, one of the Oogie Loves. Let's get him in here. Hey. 
Hi, everyone. I hope you're all having an oogie-rific day. Woo! It sounds awful. How much did this thing cost? Seriously. $60 million. $60 million? Okay, how much did it make? An oogie alien dollars. Woo! Stop screwing around with me. There's no such number as an oogie gillion. How much is that in real money? $15. Okay, $15. Like, I think the director might have agreed to this sketch for publicity, unless they replicated it perfectly. So, an incredibly limited audience movie, insistent on a gimmick, starring characters that nobody gives a fuck about, were some of the reasons it bombed. But another one was, well, it was just one of the worst movies ever made. Like, this movie is that bad. It absolutely belongs on top 10 worst baby shows. She's not supposed to go after the cookies. <laughs> yes, it's a preschool movie for fucking preschoolers, but it is just 90 minutes of the sugariest bug juice possible. Any of the fucking overprotective Facebook moms that took their kid to this movie probably because they couldn't watch Up or whatever because uh, Carl breaks his arm, that could be scary. Uh, we can't have kids be scared. That, like, that is who this movie is for. Shallow cunt soccer moms on Facebook. This movie perfectly fulfills their validation of being safe for kids of fucking helicopter parents. What do you think of the movie? It was a lot of fun, especially if you're a kid at heart. It was fun to dance. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Very entertaining. <laughs> so what did you think of the movie? Uh, interesting. <laughs> moms, what you just saw was some other mom's feedback after watching The Oogie Loves and The Big Balloon Adventure. We got a chance to go see it this morning with some of our playgroup friends and we had a wonderful time. And all the kids really enjoyed themselves. They were getting up and they were moving around. And um, I just hope everyone gets a chance to get out and see this movie because it's really important that the word gets out and Hollywood knows that this is what we want. As parents, we want more G-rated films for our children to go see. True G-rated films for our children to go see. Decide. It's family friendly. Right. Talk about the triple G rating you talked about at the okay. screening yesterday. I tried to get the Motion Picture Association of America to give us a different rating. I wanted, did I didn't tell you this? No. I wanted it to be uh, rated GGG. What's the difference? A, a G rated film now allows, if it's animation, allows some sexual innuendo, a little violence, a bad guy, and that stuff. And this movie doesn't have it. This movie can still be fun, still have drama, still have conflict, still have a goal and a, and, and a purpose, but it doesn't need the violence. It doesn't need to tell children that behave or something bad will happen to you. It just says, behave, be good, be lovely, be loving, because that's what you're supposed to do. And hopefully kids will get that message. And if you pick up emotional cues from the adults in your life and, and you learn behavior from what you see, just show love and kids will just be love. And I that agree, was the, that I was agree. Our goal. This movie is carefully crafted for young children. Now there's no faith in it, but there's a lot of goodness and kindness and love and compassion. However, one of the plot devices is magic, so be cautious. When in reality, children both enjoy and benefit from challenge. And I'm not a fucking child psychologist or whatever, but you don't need to be a child psychologist to know that. This movie actively feels like it was specifically designed to be insulting the children's intelligence as much as possible. Apparently, a lot of the investors were from mommy bloggers, so its audience did actually invest in the project. The project completely throwing away any semblance of the very obvious and important thing for children to learn is that the world is a cruel place and it ain't gonna change, motherfucker. It's why I respect early Sesame Street for being ghetto as fuck. Not everything is sunshine and rainbows. And this is the brightest rainbow known to man. I have a deep respect for Lazy Town, which is a weird but energetic show, but has thought for its audience. Sure, characters are doing backflips and shit in a world of puppets and crooked architecture. It's hammy, but it's not sugary because it encourages physical activity by showing the benefit of doing it. It's hammy in a way that provides good messages, so the over-theatricalization of everything doesn't appear as bug juice. The Yugi Loves is so sugary, you can't even read the plot summary without sounding like a complete asshole. It's the Air Free and Sloopy's birthday party, and the Yugi Loves, Gooby, Zuby, and Tooth. 
Buffy and planning a secret surprise. But when the last five magical balloons in lovely Louisville are lost, Gooby, Zooby, and Toofy must find them. Oh no, otherwise the party will be a disaster. This is also kind of a problem with my bed bugs, but these characters' names aren't fucking names. These are transcribed Angry Birds sound effects. <laughs> they will take any attempt to be unrealistically sappy, like the town is called Lovely Loveville. Like, fuck you, the world isn't like that. In comparison to my bed bugs, the characters' traits are severely flanderized to be as goofy and groovy and goofy as possible. Like, Gooby is a nerd, Zuzi is a girl, and Toofy is a jokester. But here, Goofy is a techy tech math nerd science who knows everything and reads books because he's smart. Zuzi is a girly girl who loves animals and glitter and Bows, because she's the fucking mandatory girl character. Toofy is just now a complete fucking dumbass. Which is fitting, because this is how the movie treats its audience. Oh yeah, disclaimer, uh, the footage kind of got fucked up in the transfer process. Uh, just ignore that. Uh, maybe it's a sign from God not to watch this shit. Uh, give me a break, I'm fucking watching the Oogie Love, okay? Even J. Edgar is dumbed down. Like, previously he was like the father figure, but now he's the wacky assistant. His change in voice between iterations perfectly represents his illogical shift in the dynamic. You'll have to wait until after nap time. Nap time? Woozy, even rock and roll stars need their rest. J. Edgar never lets us have such big milkshakes. <gasps> I can't believe they drank such enormous milkshakes. This movie makes me want to buy a Hoover Max Extract Pressure Pro Model 60, if you know what I'm saying. Not having a parental figure in the movie limits any opportunity for, like, teaching discipline or morals or anything. But parents are lame. They're not wacky and groovy and kooky. So we start out with J. Edgar losing the balloons for the birthday party. And, you know, uh, not the mandatory group dumbass. Because, oh no, we couldn't have the character make a mistake and accept it. That, 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 that would be sad. We, we can't have kids be sad, even at the expense of teaching reality. That would make them sad. That little toothy climbs like a squirrel after a nut. <laughs> He's faster just like you. Oh, well, I... Wait, he wants to fuck the window? Look at Barbie! What a scary bitch. The film has subtitles, which indicates the audience to both get up and sit down. The direct official commands ruin any unpredictability of the apeshit nature of a Rocky Horror screen. And there's also tons of reoccurring phrases, which get subtitles and you're supposed to shout on command. But like, they're all reoccurring, and what's the fun in shouting the same shit over and over again? It's okay to sit down now. Like, discipline a child, it should say sit down now. But that would be mean. I can't be mean to my kids, even if it's the only way that they're gonna learn how to be a functioning member of society. They can't be mean. <laughs> Toofy's pants fell down! Goofy, Toofy, pick up your pants! Goofy, Toofy, pick up your pants is the worst fucking running gag I've ever seen in a piece of media, I swear. After every fucking scene, his pants have to fall down. Like, just buy a belt, you dumb fucking shit. Like, there's no attempt at even altering the joke. Goofy, Toofy, pick up your pants! <laughs> The songs are all shit and barely connected to the plot, like, the opening number is about screaming over pancakes. Them in the air, then spin around! Like, they could actually, like, uh, introduce the characters or the plot or something, or tell a moral about, uh, eating breakfast in the morning. But no, we just get Bugs Juice instead. Unlike a Lazy Town, which could actually use this type of scenario to teach a lesson. Don't you ever get tired? How could I? I exercise, sleep well, and eat right. Mm hmm. I didn't eat any breakfast today. You didn't? 
So, fuck it, they gotta go find the balloons and go to various locations and meet shitty celebrity cameos. Like, a girl who's obsessed with squares. Aren't squares such a wacky shape? She sure is wacky! Gooby, Zuzi, and Toofy? Your names totally sound like candy. Even the fucking film knows that those aren't names, but they fucking did it anyway. The square girl's mom reminds me of the lady in the radiator from a racer head, and uh, that's not a good thing. Then they go to a 50 diner, which has milkshakes, and there's a giant cow on top of the restaurant, which is horribly superimposed. And everything in the milkshake manor is cow-themed, because ice cream has milk, and ice cream sure is yummy. Milky Marvin is a smooth-talking blues daddy-o. This fucking movie gives me the Hollywood blues. We can make a milkshake out of anything. How about peppermint, broccoli, vanilla, rutabaga, please? No problem. Fool up, ma'am. I'll have a large spray and cough syrup with Jolly Rancher on top. Then Tony Braxton shows up and instead of squares or cows, she likes roses. Cause roses are pretty, don't you just love flowers when you're eating ice cream in a field of flowers? Hip hip hooray, flowers are pretty. Wendy, I'm so sorry. Are you feeling better now, J. Edgar? Why are they so fucking horny? Then they meet a cowboy who's obsessed with bubbles, cause- Here's something you can do when you can't go to the park. Or maybe your friends can't come over to play. You could ask your mom to get some bubble liquid. I bet J. Edgar is really proud of us. I am really proud of the Oogie Loves. Proud as pecan pie. That's probably the best example in the movie of just treating kids like idiots. So this is the part of the movie where the bug juice becomes unintentionally racist. Uh, yes, racist. Christopher Lloyd and whoever this cracker is show up in a flying sombrero and are named Sombrero. Good afternoon, my colorful friends. We are Lola and Lero Sombrero. Even though they're white? Yes, I know you can be white and raised in a Spanish country and qualify as Latino cause it's a nationality, but it's fiction, they can be whatever race you please, and you choose the white people to play the Mexicans named Sombrero? Maybe no Hispanic celebrity would agree to playing this walking stereotype? Again, treating the kids like idiots, like do you seriously think the only thing a child would recognize as a non-Hispanic would be Sombrero's wide-brimmed hats? I need a DeLorean to go back to the Reagan years. He has crack. So then it starts getting windy and they lose their balloons. So fuck it, they have to get them back. Thankfully, it's resolved in like two minutes, but like uh, my blood pressure fucking spiked when that happened. Because I was hoping that antifreeze that was in the milkshake was kicking in by now, but uh, nope, they're still alive. Then they throw an awesome sauce party for their pillow! And the pillow does nothing the whole movie, like why the fuck should we care about him? And for the grand finale, they couldn't get all the shitty celebrity cameos back. So they're just projected through the linebacker window, bitch. We have for you a fantastically funny furry fairy Milkshake. Why is he giving feathers? That's like giving somebody a severed finger straight out of Dahmer's closet. Like I said, The Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure is one of the worst movies ever made. Pure bug juice that probably even insults toddlers. But I enjoyed stealing a cold bug juice from the shitty convenience store across from Dada's apartment. This nobody would like besides the shallow cunt soccer moms. It being such a bomb, it's now free with YouTube on ads. But if you want a good preschool movie that's free with ads on YouTube, just watch Follow That Bird. And if you want a good road trip MacGuffin movie for all ages, that's free on YouTube, just watch Pee Wee's Big Adventure, one of my all-time favorites even as an adult. With the internet, it's kind of a shame what the standards of preschool content has become. Like, you don't need any level of professionalism from a company anymore, and I'm sure lots of preschoolers and parents probably think that shitty CG nursery rhyme music videos are peak education. Can't forget the countless content farms of people just exploiting their cute children for internet clout. Oh, thank God I was an ugly fucking baby. Like, this little girl on YouTube probably can't even wipe her ass yet. Why does she have toys in Walmart? 
And if anything, the fact that the Oogie Loves even ever got made was probably a sign of all the YouTube kids' garbage to come. Despite the box office failure, they announced a TV show anyway. And even if that never happened, I am absolutely not surprised that that was partially funded at a point or something. Like, it's a boomer-pilled position to say, back in my day, there was less sugar. Like, don't get me wrong, my generation and generations previous had tons of sugar. But nowadays, I think there's way more bug juice, even more bug juice than when I was growing up, you know, because, like, the internet was new and not mainstream yet. But bug juice sells, and it will never go away. Like, your audience doesn't even fucking know what orange is. Teach them orange instead of just shouting colors. It may be upbeat, it may have diversity, it may be colorful. That doesn't mean anything if it's just fucking bug juice. Like, the fact that, like, kids shows barely try anymore, to my understanding, is part of why I think Bluey was such a big deal with parents. Like, when I first saw it, I'm like, holy shit, like, a kid show that tries in the 2020s? What the fuck? Like, industry standards now are, like, Johnny Johnny Yes Papa or whatever. Which is insulting, because children deserve better, and everyone fucking knows that. Before I go, I'd just like to say something. I think kids are, are smarter and better than all this junk, and if you- oh. Dare I say, the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure... <laughs> Don't let your kids what's it! We need a DeLorean to go back to the Reagan years. He has crack. Because it's not only bad for your teeth just being in your mouth, decaying your teeth from the outside, but it is even worse in the way it helps to decay your teeth from the inside by robbing your blood of calcium. Calcium is what you get from foods like...